Welcome to In A Nutshell, the podcast dedicated to all things agricultural consulting. I'm Dylan Brush here with Soil Genius and Ag Consultant, Bill Brush, and we're delighted to accompany you on this journey where we break down the different aspects of agricultural consulting. In each episode, we'll dive into the realm of agriculture through the eyes of Bill Brush, where consultants like Bill play a vital role in empowering farmers, agribusiness, and agricultural organizations. If you're passionate about agriculture, problem solving, and enjoy a little bit of detective work, this podcast is tailor-made for you. Alrighty, so we've talked about soil tests and the importance of a lot of different micronutrients, and so I feel like we should dive into calcium and magnesium, which is what you've previously said are the two of the most important, if not the most important, uh, nutrients in soil structure and soil in general. So if you'd like to dive into that a little bit more, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in hearing. Well, thank you, Dylan. Yeah, we're going to talk about what I like to call the cation twins, calcium magnesium, and they fight for position on the soil colloid all the time. And the reason they're so in important in soil structure, obviously, is when we get them correct, they make up 80% of everything held on there. In the nutrient holding capacity, 80% of them is calcium magnesium, with calcium being far the superior one at 68% with 12% magnesium. But magnesium is always fighting with calcium. And, and one of the reasons that they are fighting with each other, it's not like a boxing match or anything, but when one is, is uh, you know, we talk about total exchange capacity and cation exchange capacity. These are ex- exchangeable nutrients, which microbiology is, is removing them, mineralizing them, and, and giving them. And as soon as one gets off, one goes back on there. So the fight between calcium and magnesium is very, very, uh, it's just a struggle that happens all the time. And if there's a lot of free magnesium around, around, then magnesium will begin to take the place of every time calcium gets removed. Uh, Conversely, if we have a lot of free calcium in our soils, or if we're applying them to through the water or, you know, as uh, dry amendments to soil, we have an opportunity to always have calcium available. So if we do lose one, we replace it with uh, a calcium. You know, they're they're very strong, and the reason I call them cation twins is they're both strong, double positive cations that are held tightly on the soil colloid. You know, you have some single ones which will be, you know, uh, potassium. You have something like even sodium, and you have one that's lightly held like hydrogen, which is why it's so easy to get off of that soil colloid and move it with with one of these stronger cations. When we get really acidic, uh, we can put on some limestone and and limestone in the presence of acid, which is what too much hydrogen is. It will basically dissolve that calcium carbonate molecule, releasing calcium, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, and it will push that hydrogen right off the soil colloid and you can build calcium up rapidly. So they're both strong cations. And, uh, and they're usually, I, in fact, I haven't seen a soil where I haven't found them both in all soils. We can see some extremely depressed. I've seen uh, magnesium get down to 4 or 5% when we really like to keep it at least to 12%. And I've seen calciums get down into the, the high 20s, 25 to 28%. Uh, and those soils obviously weren't doing very well. And they are always both together, but and they occur in large soluble quantities. In other words, they're there in quantities enough to be soluble enough to get on the soil colloid or to be mineralized and delivered to the plant. And they reside in a, on the uh, chemical periodic table. They're in the alkaline earth metal group, and they usually are a silver white colored metal they look very similar and then they're usually supplied to the plant in a, in a thing we call mass flow which means that mixture that I talked about earlier in soil structure of air and water becomes the soil solution and that soil solution as it moves towards the roots of the plant is what we call mass flow which is where a lot of nutrients are supplied to that plant they're in that soil solution. They both are very essential plant nutrients. We talk about soil structure and how important they are there, but the plant also needs them in in fairly good quantity to do all of its biological functions. So so when I say that, you know, and and this is something that over the years we've looked at, uh, the percent portion of a plant in terms of percentage is made up of what, you know, element. And the two biggest ones are carbon 
at 41.2% and oxygen at 46.3%. So 87.5% are basically of that molecule or of that plant, I should say, are of those two elements. And that's because the plants basically use carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to make sugar, which is what plants do. And because of that, the majority, you know, as I said, 87.5%, are those two molecules, or oh, I should say elements. I keep going molecules, it should be elements. After that, quickly, is hydrogen, which, guess where that's coming from? Water, there's a lot of water in plants, so that's the, that molecule of uh, H is in there. Next, we have, obviously, a nitrogen, which everybody always is applying nitrogen. And then we're worried about potash and phosphorus and micronutrients and sulfur. But right after nitrogen, a portion of the plant and a percentage for it is calcium. And we'll talk about where calcium is and why it's there. Then we have, and it's at 2.1% of that plant is calcium, followed by potassium at uh, 8 tenths of a percent, magnesium at uh, 4 tenths of a percent, and then we're down to phosphorus at three tenths, and then we start to get smaller and smaller amounts of sulfur, chlorine, iron, all the way down to these micronutrients, which gets, gets less and less and less, till we get out to molybdenum, which is a small, small amount of what that plant is. And some of them that we talked about earlier, like cobalt, nickel, they aren't even detectable, hardly at all. So they are necessary, but hardly detectable. In this next part, Bill's gonna get into the importance of calcium in your soil. So let's talk about calcium because it's the one that of of these one of the two that we're talking about together is these cation twins. Well, let's talk about calcium. You know, as I said before, it promotes porosity in the soil if we can get it into the proper amount of base saturation, which normally is a minimum of 60 up to 70 and sometimes even above 70%. What do I mean by porosity? That means airspace places that air can reside, which then can help give the environment for microbiology to thrive in. You know, and Dr. Albrecht, that I studied quite a bit, said that, you know, our job as soil scientists is to provide a house for the biology to thrive in. And what he meant was, is get the soil structure proper and microbiology will thrive, granted that we will also be adding water because they need water and air to do all of their biological functions. So by increasing pore space or porosity, and we can call it airspace if you like, we're going to promote microbial growth. And by promoting microbial growth, you're allowing a more efficient way to mineralize things not all not only off the clay particle, but also that are tied up, pent up in the the soil itself and maybe not residing on the soil colloid, but could be made av available with a very vigorous microbiology. And it combines with other uh, elements to form calcium pectate and an oxalate for the structure of the cell. And that's where you find the majority of your calcium is in the, the pectates, which if you, anybody that's ever made jelly or, or jam, one of the things about jelly is you add pectin. Why? To hold those things together so that it, it's more of a, uh, a gel that's held together with pectin. Well, in, in plants, you're holding cells together with calcium pectate, and that's where you'll find parts of your calcium. The other thing you'll find calcium is in the vacuoles of the cell. We're filling up those cells. Once they, you have cell division occur, you're filling them up and you're filling them up with a lot of calcium to fill up that space. If you can imagine all the cells and you understand pretty quickly why there is so much calcium, you know, 2% of that plant is, uh, is calcium. It also is just a side, if you're growing fruit crops, you know, it delays the degradation of the of fruit structure, basically. Once it starts to build, it holds that, not only the calcium, but also the other nutrients to allow for those cells to not just wither away, you know, if we don't have quite enough water, we immediately shrivel up the, the fruit and then basically destroy the structure. But with calcium, we can maintain that soil structure even in times of stress. And that's because calcium relieves a lot of plant stress. Uh, basically, it's a, a valuable nutrient spread throughout the whole plant. Uh, one thing I talked about earlier, particularly in your soil, is that calcium will really improve nitrogen efficiency. 
And I'm going to tell you that in, in a lot of programs that have been run or tests that have been run, research that has been performed, they always, a lot of times, will put certain plants down as low as, as uh, 70%, 60% of nitrogen efficiency. It means for every 100 pounds you put on, you only get 60 to 70 into the plant. But with the proper amount of calcium up in that 68% range, you begin to improve your nitrogen efficiency upwards of 90 and maybe up to 95%. So that means you're getting all of your applied nitrogen, you're getting the majority of it into the plant, which is your target while we're putting it out there. So to think you can get that much more by having calcium, you understand how valuable calcium can be in lowering costs because I don't have to put on as much nitrogen as I'm used to because I'm still getting in. I'll give you some anecdotal evidence as well as, as the information I'm providing. You know, I started in, in several areas of the state. One of the things I noticed, they were applying way too much nitrogen and even their tissue samples shows that they were low to very low. And uh, these calcium numbers on these soils were like 40% magnesium and 40% calcium. And there was 80%, but way distorted as to where they needed to be to be a balance. We began to work on getting those calciums upwards of 60 to 65 to 70%. And then, sure enough, when we started, some of these crops were taking two to two and a half times the amount of nitrogen that they needed for the crop use. And by the time we finished, and it, it took us somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six years, we had them down to the point where we were getting almost 90 to 95% efficiency on almost every crop. Well, that made a lot of difference. And not only that, just the water efficiency of seeing water go into these soils rather than running off because the, the soil was so plated from too much magnesium and really sticky and hard soils that when just a little bit, half an inch of rainfall would come, it would immediately sheet and run off. And so what we were able to do by getting our calcium up, not only were we able to improve our nitrogen efficiency, we we're also improving the ability of it to receive and utilize water and therefore giving the water and air balance that we needed to improve microbial activity, which then led to, of course, better nitrogen efficiency. If we get our calcium up into those 68 to 70 percent range, we'll find over time that we will reduce pHs down to a point where they're probably close to where we want them to be, around 7, maybe slightly below. Uh, this doesn't take place overnight, particularly the heavier the soil, the longer it's going to take. The sandier the soil, the, the quicker it is going to be able to make these things work quick, more quickly because we have less clay particles to change to the proper amounts, the proper exchange capacity to be able to put the right nutrients and the right quantities onto that clay colloid to make it work the way it was intended to be. We all can also can increase the availability of phosphorus and molybdenum in acid soils because obviously those calcium molecules, if you're using limestone, are going to basically break up, which is going to raise that pH in these acid soils and allow phosphorus to be more available along with molybdenum. The one downside to, to calcium, or there's actually two that I wanted to say, is one is, is it's not very mobile in plant tissue. So it does not lend itself well to foliar applications because wherever it lands is usually where it stays. You'll find other uh, nutrients that they're very mobile and, and will move throughout the plant, throughout the cells, but calcium, sadly enough, is not one of those. And also, every excess always seems to strike at calcium and calcium removal. A, good, a few good examples are, if we put too much acid onto the so soils, it'll be at the expense of calcium. Excess nitrogen, pound for pound, for every pound of excess nitrogen that gets leached through the soil, will take out a pound of soluble calcium. So going back to those soils that were so high in magnesium and low in calcium, they were putting more and more nitrogen on to get enough into the plant because their efficiency was so low. And at the same time, this excess nitrogen, if it went through the soil, it basically just stripped out more and more calcium. So it's just going down, down, down with everything that you're doing, trying to get more nitrogen, you're actually stripping out more calcium. So calcium seems to be at the brunt of every deficiency that we see down here because Dr. Albrecht liked to say, if we get the proper amount of calcium on the soil colloids the way that we want to, between that 65 and 70 percent, all the other nutrients become more available. And they don't go in with calcium, 
as he explained it, they go over the back of calcium, meaning calcium present around the roots makes nutrients go into those roots easier in the presence of calcium. Uh, a lot of people for years have seen the value of a, of a can 17. Uh, and somewhere out of this country, it may be even called a can 15. But it's calcium nitrate. And one of the things about that is, is there's calcium and you have both forms of nitrogen in the presence of calcium. And so all of a sudden your nitrogen efficiency is very, very good. A lot of people see this immediate green up with CAN-17. And one of those reasons is you've put both forms of nitrogen in the presence of calcium, which as Dr. Albeck said, everything goes in over the back of calcium or is enhanced by calcium around those root hairs. So it's another huge value. If you have some uh, toxic high concentrations of something like boron or something maybe of another micronutrient or even potassium, which can get too high and sodium can get too high. Well, calcium's very effective at detoxifying high concentrations of these elements. Uh, one of the, my experiences was working on walnuts, which are very, very sensitive to boron. And these boron levels were extremely high and calcium levels were extremely low. And somewhere in the later in the summer, as the, the boron started to pull starch from the leaves and put it into the nuts, it was not controlled by any means and it basically fried the leaves, leaving a, a very poor canopy, leaving a lot of sunburn on these nuts, and then the quality going way down in uh, quantity. But with the presence of calcium, it had a huge amount of controlling boron and basically detoxifying by controlling how much of the other nutrients that got out of those leaves and didn't pull them away too fast. So it was a really soft, straight on what I mean by detoxifying. Um, Calcium is, is uh, available in many forms, primarily those things that most are used in the amending process because a lot of times because you're needing 80%, 60 per, 65 to 70% calcium, 10 to 15% magnesium, what you find is is a lot of times we're putting on 1,000, 2,000, up to maybe even 8,000 pounds of a soil amendment. And these soil amendments are you know, normally in the form of ag lime or limestone, and there's some forms I'll talk about in a minute, or we're looking at dolomite, which is a combination of calcium and magnesium, or we're looking at gypsum, which is a combination of calcium and sulfate. Those are the three primary ones we use. There's some other uh, ones that, but these are the most common. There's a, you know, you can use a uh, hydrated lime, you can use a few other things, but those three are for cost and uh, effectiveness work really, really well. Now Bill's going to get into talking about the differences between limestone and gypsum and why he thinks limestone is the better option for fixing the pH in your soil. One of the things I found early on, and I'd read a lot of books, and every book you read says that if your soil has a high pH above 7, particularly if it got to be above 7.5, that you could not use limestone, you could only use gypsum. That was the only way you would ever make any effective change. Well, over my experience over the years, I'm going to tell you the only really well way you're going to effectively change high mag soils in high pH conditions is the use of limestone. I know that most people like looking at low pH and immediately using limestone. And there's a thing I like to say all the time, and it says, of course you do, because, but the problem with it is it works. And people look at me funny and say, well, isn't that what we're trying to do? But it confuses exactly what's happening on the soil colloid and what truly mineralizes. You're taking a very, very minor or weak cation in hydrogen, so anything is going to be able to push it off the soil colloid, and you're going to take a calcium that's going to be released in massive amounts by a massively acid soil. Soil, think about this. If your soil is of a 5 pH, that's 5 on 2 million pounds of soil. And the pH of all that soil is at 5. So if you put a ton, 2 ton, even 3 ton of limestone out there, it's going to basically dissolve rapidly, release calcium. Calcium is going to push that hydrogen off and you're going to immediately build your calcium right up in your soils. This is why people think that's the only way calcium works. But in a high pH soil, 
one of the problems is, is gypsum is not like an acid product that naturally is going to make it more available. It basically is a little more soluble than uh, calcium carbonate or limestone, which is essentially insoluble, which needs acid. So a lot of people ask me, well, if you've got a high pH and it's insoluble, it's not ever going to do anything. Well, one of the mistakes most people make on calcium is they never take into consideration what the microbiology needs and what the microbiology can do. And so what we do is we throw out limestone with no regard to how big the particle size is. So in other words, if you take your limestone and you see you've got, we'll just take a number, 30% uh, calcium, and you put on a ton, you're going to have 600 pounds of calcium. Okay, that's great. But how are you going to get that calcium to release? Well, first thing is, is that you have to remember microbiology is, as they say, micro, very small, microscopic. You can't see it. And so if you throw out things that are as big as even sand, but we'll go a little bit and make it a little crazier, throw out pebbles of limestone. And essentially, what I like to say is, it's like now the microbes are going to look at that, that calcium uh, carbonate, and it's like trying to feed a basketball to fleas. There is not enough surface area for them to get in contact with so that they can begin to release the calcium that's tied up with that calcium carbonate. And what that microbe does, if he has a small enough particle site, can begin to over a period of one to three years, release the calcium by injecting along that particle, you know, injects his organic acid with, within his body to etch it and release a calcium carbonate, which turns in with his organic acid to calcium, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. And then that microbe's gonna look at that reaction and say, let's do that again. And again, until all of a sudden you build, start to build up percentages on your base saturation, your calcium is going from 40 to 50, to 55, to 60, and on up to where it needs to be. One of the things you have to do though, if you don't take into consideration what that particle size is, you're feeding something that will have little or no effect. As you want to get soil amendments and you say, I need calcium and calcium is what I need, that is what, you know, I use a lot of limestone because I like the clean reaction. There really isn't anything left. When it dissolves that calcium carbonate, it has what it needs, calcium, releases carbon dioxide as a gas, and has oxygen, which will find some hydrogen from that acid that it injected and make a water molecule. So it's a very clean product, not leaving anything behind. When you put on something like gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, and it's soluble and the calcium separates from the sulfate, that sulfate now is available to, as a double negative, a very, very strong anion, the strongest one we use in soil, uh, conditioning, and it's going to grab something, and maybe it's going to grab something you don't want it to do, which is maybe more calcium to actually hurt you overall of reducing your calcium even more. Now Bill's going to explain how particle size works and why it's so important to effectively transferring the nutrients into your soil. And so we've gotten on to this problem, and like I say, one of the problems is it works over here, but it shouldn't work over there. You've, you've taken logic that's sound here, but it's not the same conditions here, so therefore it can't work. You just need to know particle size is very, very important. I've seen more people uh, be unsuccessful trying to change the, the amendment part of this their program by using too large particles. You know, And what is too large? Well, we'd like to get everything, if we could, down so that most of it basically passes through 100 mesh. Well, that's the equivalent of 100 holes in a square inch has a very, very tiny size. It basically is very, very fine that gets through that. Now anything 60, say a 60 to 100 that will pass through that 100 to 60 mesh screen <coughs> will probably be available, take a little longer on everything that's a little bigger. Once you get down to 20 and 40, it's too large and you won't have uh, very much success getting much amending cap you know, qualities out of that line. Even your gypsum, if it's not a small particle, won't have much success because it won't dissolve. It won't become in, go into solution. One of the values of calcium sulfate is it does break down the surface tension right on the surface and allows water to go through that top uh, barrier to get it into the soil. Okay, so getting our calcium 
and, and getting the right particle size, using a high quality limestone that's 30% calcium ore. These are all parts of, of a research that you need to do to get the proper uh, material for the proper amending that you want it to do. And also with a good soil test, later down the road, I'll explain to you how you can tell pound for pound what we need to do to get rid of magnesium or to get rid of sodium or something you have in your soil and you, that you want to now dominate with calcium for all those good reasons. Now Bill's going to get into explaining the other twin in the calcium-magnesium relationship, which is magnesium. Well, it's twin as calcium likes to flocculate or basically likes to pull together. And if you can imagine pulling things together creates airspace between them, that's how it creates airspace, by flocculating or pulling calcium ions together. And when it does that, basically, it creates that airspace that we're desiring to open it up. Well, magnesium, it does just the opposite. It tightens the soil. Basically, it plates and takes up space in those air pores that we are trying to open up, and it's just doing directly the opposite, which is why calcium has to be in that higher, that 65 to 60 eight percent of what's on those clay particles to be able to get to the point where it can basically keep magnesium where it needs to be which is there in the proper quantities a good high mag soil will be like walking across a cement floor or even a wood floor that's very very hard it has no give to it very very stiff once you get a good high calcium soil with low magnesium and you walk across it, you will find how light and how actually spongy it feels like when you get it to the proper soil structure. That, why is it light and spongy? Because we've put air back into that soil and it'll sponge, but those will be resilient and those air pockets will come right back. Now, if you get a big tractor when it's wet and you go across there and compact them, yeah, you will push out the airspace and it will stay out because those ruts will stay there forever until you break them back up, recalcify that area, and get that soil structure back to what it needs. But I want to diminish magnesium because it is quite important. You know, it's the central mineral constituent of chlorophyll. In fact, it is at the chlorophyll molecule. It's at the center, which needs to be there. So obviously, the most important thing plants do is photosynthesis. They remove carbon dioxide with the advent of water and they make glucose and send it to the roots for the roots to be restored and grow and turn energy and then turn those, ener those, those glucose molecules into energy and those calories and everything else that they manufacture in the roots to go back for the plant growth. But so it's the central constituent. So what happens when you start to short something for magnesium? You diminish its, its ability to perform photosynthesis at the maximum level that you can get it. There are also several enzyme systems throughout the plant. And without the proper amount of magnesium, they won't be activated. And when they're not activated, they slow down other biological functions. You know, as I said, it really is important for photosynthesis, but it also promotes the re retention of other cations and anions in the soil. If you don't have enough magnesium and it's nothing but air, everything wants to go right through. It's too much air and not enough of magnesium to hold it together. A good way to look at this is a real super sandy beach type sand. And you may be farming it, but one of the things you notice is that your pickup or even your tractor in some cases with real low magnesium in terms of, to, definitely in terms of pounds, as you drive across there, you get stuck just in the sand because there is nothing to hold the sand together. That small amount of clay that's in that sand doesn't have enough magnesium to pull it together and give you retention so that it will hold that up and give you sh enough structure. Here we're going just the opposite of calcium. Calcium, we're trying to push magnesium off and build up structure by building pore space. In super sandy soils, we got plenty of airspace. What we need is something to hold it together. And that's why your magnesium percentage, rather than being 12%, may get up to 20% and may get up higher than that because you need to get your magnesium in terms of pounds to 200 to 250 pounds to act, have it work and act properly. When we don't have enough, again, other cations like potassium and uh, some of our micronutrients can actually almost be leached out because there's so much airspace and nothing to hold them on the way through. So the base saturation should always be somewhere 
between 10 and 20 with the idea that you may have to add even additional magnesium to get above 20% in those super sandy locations, or you may do- drop clear down to 10% on extremely heavy soil because then we don't need much of anything to hold it together because the clay by itself will hold things together so that you won't need as nearly as much magnesium. You need magnesium for all of these other plant processes, but to hold the soil together, not nearly as much. So down to clear down to 10%. As opposed to calcium, which is very immobile, magnesium is highly mobile. So it becomes, if you're a little light in the soil, it is something that you can make up a little bit by doing a little bit of foliar because it is very mobile once it gets into the tissue, but it's got to be a good high quality foliar so that it does get into the plant, breaks that barrier and gets in so that it can be used, utilized there or in other parts of the plant. The rate of uptake can be depressed by other cations. What do I mean by that? Potassium, ammonium, calcium, manganese, and even hydrogen can actually depress how much of it gets into the plant because there's so much it available. So if you've over nitrogen, you got way too much uh, ammonium, which is positively charged, which is going to compete with it, or way too much calcium. I've seen soils as high as, as 85, 86% calcium on the base saturation and only four or five on the uh, magnesium. So it's out competing because there's also a lot of free calcium around. So having your soil balanced doesn't mean just getting arrow high calciums and everything else will be right. It's getting the proper amount of calcium with the proper amount of magnesium. In the presence of all the other cations, now we're beginning to get to that point where we're talking not only soil structure, but really good balanced soil, which is where maximum production will usually reside. Once you, this is an odd thing about magnesium magnesium also. Everybody understands when you get really low, magnesium is harder and harder to pick up by the plant. There's less and less of it available, so it makes sense it's going to be deficient and has a hard time picking it up. But once that base saturation in most soils, not your extreme sands, but we'll talk most soils above an exchange capacity of five or six, once they're above that, if you get magnesium above 20%, it will limit efficient utilization. In other words, it will begin to plate to the point, guess what, where it plugs up the airspace and doesn't allow the microbial population to mineralize the proper amounts of magnesium to get them to the plant. So what happens instead, it doesn't allow that to happen. And then if more magnesium is applied, magnesium gets higher and higher, which continues to plate. And pretty soon you have a significant issue where not really much of anything is getting picked up. Uh, We also need it in the formations of protein and protein synthesis in the plant. Very, very important for for all plants to build the proper amounts of protein. It's also uh, involved a lot in the regulation, and that's through uh, obviously photosynthesis, but in the regulation of the cellular pH. So keeping the pH from getting too acidic or too basic. And in terms of that soil pH, and this, this is one of the things that confounds me, because if you say calcium has a, a, an effect on soils of 1, then magnesium would be 1.6 times that effect on the pH of the soil. Most people think that it's calcium controls pH, but actually calcium, I mean magnesium has a much greater effect 1.6 times, and potassium has a greater effect, and sodium has a huge effect at this point on the pH of actually the soil. So getting our, our magnesium down into that nice 10 to 15% is going to create a lot, of easier, a lot easier effort for you to be able to get your pH regulated so that we get to that magic place where all the nutrients become more available. Now, magnesium and calcium, they are competing all the time like a battle for space on a soil colloid. But the free magnesium, because it's so small in terms of the size of calcium, it's held more tightly on the soil colloid. And even if it gets off and it's in the soil solution, it basically will get held on the, the clay plates. Not necessarily the small clay colloids, but the plates that reside in there that are made of clay within the soil. And they are really hard to move. So they don't really leach through, even though you've driven them off. So the thing that if you don't watch your soil consistently, mag will begin to creep back in to your life from these clay plates. They can hold up to 98% of the space available on clay particles. And what I mean by they, calcium, magnesium, 
they can be almost everything that's held on that clay colloid. It's ama amazing that 98% of everything. And so they are very strong cations. They know their place and they are pushing as hard as they can to take up as many spaces as possible. It's like a struggle all the time of one side trying to push the other side off and the other side trying to push the other side. It's like a tug of war all the time to get places on that soil colloid. But their balance, that ability to get 65 to 70% calcium and 10 to 15% magnesium holds the real true key to soil structure and soil tilt. That feel of when you pick up your soil and squeeze it, it just crumbles in your hand with that really good aroma because it's got a lot of air for microbiology. It also has good feel, that tilt, that what a farmer likes in a soil, it just breaks apart. His tillage tools go across it much easier and they break it down and it comes down into very small particles it's because there's enough air for that to happen. But the balance really of always keeping them in the proper, and a lot of people will talk about ratios. It really, the ratio really doesn't mean much because in a sandy soil, that should be about a three to one. But in a super heavy clay soil, it's almost a seven to one. So those things being the case, you really can't say it's a ratio. The heavier the soil, the more calcium we need. The lighter the soil, the more magnesium we need. And so, but the balance of those two, having them in a range, a good range, holds the key to the top production and always top production comes with the best water efficiency. So if I could summarize just a little bit, calcium and magnesium are essential nutrients, even though they are called secondary. But secondary, if you think about it, and their role in, the, in terms of soil structure of holding 80% of what's on that soil colloid, hard to envision them as being called secondary. They are very, very important. And then sometimes when you're looking at what is the priority of nutrients I should apply to my soil, many times I will say the limestone or the dolomite is what you're going to need to get those soils into the best shape so that we can get air back into them and make the efficiency of everything else you have. And everything will work better once we get our, our balance and our soil structure right. You can usually get them into the plant by mass flow. I did say you can get some, but it's just a minor amount, but you can get some magnesium through foliar. You can get some calcium in. It's just not very mobile to move throughout the plant, but you can get some in there. That, but mass flow is the priority. That's what usually happens. They are major competitors all the time. So why would you just put out, after what I've told you, just magnesium just because I haven't put out any in a long time? You do that because you have a soil test that says, I need magnesium. My crop is not performing like it should, and my tissues may be a little light. And when I get my soil soils back, I see that yes, I am definitely low of magnesium, or I'm extremely high of magnesium, and I need to get that magnesium off so I can make it more available to the plant and also the other nutrients. With the proper amounts of magnesium, it's going to control several plant processes as well as calcium will control several plant processes. And so those two together become so critical because they control literally the microbiology. One of the things I talked about earlier about how the microbe would basically take that small calcium carbonate and release the calcium by injecting an acid. If you have that type of soil where you need to get more calcium in it because you are very, very low, 40, 50, those microbes are literally starving for calcium because we talked about what calcium did for the soil structure what it was to glue cells together, what it was to fill the vacuoles of those cells in that plant. Well, the microbe itself is doing the same thing. It needs that calcium basically to glue cells together as it reproduces, and it needs to fill its cells with calcium. So because you are starving it for calcium, when it has an opportunity, it will begin to harvest calcium from that limestone if we've done a good job of getting the particle size and the volume in the right place at the right time. And so with that in mind and calcium, you see that they are the key. Uh, and you say, well, how in the world can a little microbe do anything with that amount of calcium? Next time you're on your farm or out in your garden, I want you to reach down and pick up a pinch between your thumb and forefinger of soil. And within that pinch of soil, 
there's somewhere between six to eight billion organisms. That's billion with a B. So think about all the people in the world. You have almost the population of the earth between your fingers in terms of organisms. I told you there's two million pounds in an acre of soil. So take that pinch and see how many pinches it takes to make two million pounds. And then you take that many pinches, multiply it by, we'll just take seven billion. It's a phenomenal number. And what we're trying to do with soil structure and what we're trying to do with getting calcium and magnesium right to get the proper amount of air and water in there for those microbes is to turn on that microbiology. It's just there trying to get the proper environment so that they can thrive. Uh, we're trying to be, build, as Dr. Albrecht liked to say, we're trying to build the house for the biology to thrive in. Then once we've got our structure and house built, then we can begin to fill that house with the rest of the nutrients and the rest of the micronutrients until we have some of our top production. I don't have at this point a lot more to say about calcium magnesium, but hopefully I've emphasized today in today's podcast the importance of these two cation twins. They're so unalike, but I call them twins because we find them competing for the same spot all the time. And it's this struggle that we need to manage to improve our soil structure and keep that soil structure where our soils perform at maximum level. So for today, that's all I have for you. Agriculture in a Nutshell, signing off for today. Thank you, Bill, for another fantastic episode of Agriculture in a Nutshell. I'm sure that many people will appreciate your insight on the cation twins, calcium and magnesium. Be sure to stay tuned for future episodes and make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And never forget to stay curious.